Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, MPC special, the Monetary Policy Committee special of the South African Reserve Bank, which is uh, due to deliver its latest call on interest rates. You'll know that it's the second meeting for the year and uh, the governor bang on time. Uh, let's take you straight to what he is saying. Generally lower than they were a year ago, but underlying inflation is still elevated. Good inflation has declined significantly as supply shocks wear off, but there is evidence of stronger inflation in services across a range of economies. Meanwhile, Unemployment rates remain low, especially in the United States. In these circumstances, major global central banks are expected to cut rates at a slower pace and to start cutting at a later stage. A few emerging market central banks have been reducing rates already, but these economies had the largest hikes previously, and their interest rates are now well above inflation. The Monetary Policy Committee also noted that the Bank of Japan has moved its policy rate into positive territory, increasing interest rates for the first time since 2007. Turning to South Africa. The economy performed worse than expected in the fourth quarter of last year, expanding just 0.1%. Growth for 2023 as a whole was 0.6%. The main reason for this bad performance was supply-side problems. Electricity load shedding was worse than in previous years. Port and rail problems also emerged as binding constraints on output. Our forecasts indicate a modest growth acceleration from this year as these supply constraints, supply side constraints relax. In particular, we expect the load shedding burden will ease somewhat. While we estimate electricity shortages took 1.5 percentage points of GDP last year, we expect this to moderate to 0.6 percentage points this year and 0.2 percentage points in 2025. Overall, we see growth at 1.2 percent this year, improving to 1.6 percent by 2026. These projections are better than the 2023 outcomes but below longer run averages, which are around 2%. The risks to this growth forecast appear balanced. Turning to inflation, South Africa had a more gradual acceleration in inflation than many peer countries with a lower peak after COVID. However, the return to target has been slow. The most recent inflation numbers showed yet another delay on the way back to our 4.5% objective, with headline up to 5.6% in February. This is nearer the top of the, our target range than the midpoint. Core inflation also rose to 5%. This rise in core was due to an acceleration in services, which was led by the medical aid component. Services inflation is now at its highest since 2019. This suggests that South Africa is joining the global trend of services rather than goods becoming a major source of inflation. The committee still sees headline inflation heading back to 4.5%. However, given extra inflationary pressures, headline now reaches the target midpoint only at the end of 2025, which is later than previously expected. As a result, 
the policy stance in our baseline forecast also starts to normalize later. In assessing this forecast, the MPC noted a range of risks. Inflation expectations have moderated in the latest survey. This is welcome, but two year ahead expectations are still in the top half of our target range. Expectations are projected to ease towards our 4.5% objective as inflation slows, but we have little margin to absorb shocks as long as inflation expectations are high. Regarding food prices, we are at a difficult juncture. Last year, food inflation hit the highest levels since 2008. Food inflation has now slowed, but this is a critical time in the growing season and the weather has been unusually hot and dry, which may cause food inflation to pick up again. Considering the exchange rate, the rent has been trading somewhat weaker than we expected at our last MPC meeting. This is partly due to interest rates in the major advanced economies staying high for longer. The currency is also under pressure from weakening terms of trade. Furthermore, investors see significant near-term domestic uncertainty. We view the exchange rate as undervalued. On balance, the various risks to the inflation forecast are skewed to the upside. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to hold the repo rate unchanged at 8.25%. The decision was unanimous. At this level of rates, the policy stance is considered restrictive, consistent with the inflation outlook and the need to address elevated inflation expectations. The inflation and repo rate projections from the quarterly projection model remain a broad policy guide, changing from meeting to meeting in response to new data. The committee decisions will continue to be data dependent and sensitive to the balance of risks to the forecast. Stabilizing inflation at the midpoint of the target band will improve the economic outlook and reduce borrowing costs. Finally, we reiterate the views of the MPC on additional measures that would improve economic conditions. These include achieving a prudent public debt level, improving the functioning of network industries, lowering administered price inflation, and keeping real wage growth in line with productivity gains. Thank you very much for your attention. And at this stage, we would like to invite you to pose any questions that you might have uh, to the MPC, and uh, we would then uh, address your questions. As usual, please identify yourself and the media house that you represent. Good afternoon, Governor and uh, the MPC panel members. My name is Dando Tukwana from Bloomberg News. Um, Governor, could you speak more about the uh, El Nino-induced weather patterns and how those could um, complicate your efforts in trying to bring down inflation? Uh, what do you see there? Uh, and also just an update on GFECRA on the transfer of the funds to Treasury. How far are we in that process? Has, has the transfer um, occurred or are we um, still uh, facilitating it? Thank you.
afternoon, Governor and Deputy Governors. This is Kopa Nogumbi from Reuters. Uh, two questions. The, I know you say it's a broad policy um, guidance, but in QPM, you've guided for roughly a 50 basis point cut this year. Uh, and given that you speak of so many upside risks, especially on the domestic front, how committed is the committee to achieving this by the end of the year? And then secondly, even though you, the committee has revised its own inflation forecasts up slightly, um, as you mentioned, inflation expectations are still above your desired point, does this signal to the committee that respondents are making room for an additional hike, or how do you interpret the fact that your I, I, the inflation expectations are still above your targets? Thank you. Rianda? Oh, this one. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. I'm Balesa from CNBC Africa. Governor, we remember very well that you started hiking before the Fed. Was there any discussion of you expressed around the need to start loosening monetary policy? And my second question to you is, how difficult was it to reach what you have called a sufficient consensus at, uh, or rather in arriving at today's monetary policy decision? Is I the under? Thanks, Governor. The question is from Claire Bissica at Financial Mail. How high is the bar for the first rate cut in the cycle? That is, how important is the Fed's um, first cut before the sub, um, that the Fed cuts before the sub? And how important is it, is, is it that inflation expectations continue to fall all the way to 4.5% before you start to cut? Thank you. Let me deal with uh, this round of questions. Uh, uh, first, and maybe let's start uh, right at the uh, at the end. Um, um, so, Palesa asks um, uh, that we hiked before the uh, the Fed, and have we considered uh, cutting before the Fed? And Claire says, how high is the bar before uh, for the cut before um, uh, the Fed uh, moves and the inflation expectations? So. <coughs> We don't follow the Fed. We watch the Fed. Because the decisions of the Fed have got implications for the global economy, and that has got consequences for the South African economy. And so, what the major central banks do, including the Fed, matters for global financial conditions as they had embarked on a process over the past two years of tightening policy, global financial conditions tightened. And when that happened, we saw capital starting to flow back to the advanced economies away from emerging market uh, economies. And that led to a realignment of exchange rates, and thus exchange rates of emerging market countries depreciated, and so did the rent. So we watch the Fed, but we do not follow the Fed uh, basis point for basis point or wait for them to do things. As a matter of fact, as we say in the statement, that there are a number of emerging market economies, mainly in Latin America, that have begun to cut rates. But there is something that distinguishes those uh, country economies from South Africa. Those countries tightened policy long before South Africa started uh, tightening policy. And secondly, their nominal rates went way higher than what we had seen in South Africa. That meant that they were also able to rein in inflation earlier. And so their inflation has declined faster than ours has declined. And what you then have is that they now have higher real interest rates uh, than we had seen uh, earlier because their inflation has declined and they had increased rates uh, faster than 
uh, us. So if you were to look at any of those countries, you will find that their real rates are something around 6%, depending, uh, give or take, depending on uh, different countries. Whereas uh, ours, um, if you take the 2026 uh, uh, forecast of uh, 4.5, you would say that we are running interest rates of 375 basis points uh, real. So we are still uh, below those. So they have more policy room than we do, and that is why you could see them doing what uh, they had done. What would be the bar for South Africa cutting the rates? The bar is the same. You just have to look at what is happening to the inflation rate and what is happening to the future trajectory of inflation. And to the extent that inflation is expected to decline to target and would be sustained at that uh, 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 midpoint of our inflation target range, which is 4.5%, then at that stage, the MPC could confidently look at that and say, is this sustained on a forward-looking basis? And then we will consider recalibrating policy as, um, uh, as appropriate. And of course, what also matters here is the question that Copano raises about uh, the expectations uh, 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 that we see. And so expectations matter because they tell us something about future uh, inflation, unlike the figure that you had seen printed last week. Because if you look at that figure from last week, you are basically backward looking. But we are also cognizant of the fact that the most re recent inflation prints do influence inflation expectations. And that is why it is important that the actions of the MPC are forward looking so that future prints of inflation are consistent with our inflation objective and thus help to bring inflation expectations down to the target uh, as uh, we, uh, we have it. And so Copano says uh, the QPM had uh, uh, forecast cuts of 50 basis points for uh, this year and how committed is the MPC to realize that the QPM is one input into our decision making process. And um, we will look at the, what the QPM says and you know, we can outsource our decisions to the QPM. We, have, we sit and we have deliberations uh, about what the outlook looks like and what the appropriate policy would be uh, to deal with, um, uh, with that, uh, with that um, uh, uh, outlook. And what are the risks to the forecast and whether those risks are materializing or are threatening to materialize, in which case we will have to consider policy appropriately to make sure that uh, we deal uh, with the risks. And so then this brings uh, links back to the question of uh, consensus, which Palesa raised, and uh, uh, how difficult was it to, um, you said sufficient consensus, no. It's a unanimous decision. It is not just a, it's a unanimous decision uh, of the committee. It's never easy. This uh, MPC, you know, there are three PhDs in this uh, uh, MPCs. And you put any two of them, uh, each one of them will have two opinions. So now imagine with three. And so the deliberations are always rigorous. And uh, what is in no doubt is that we consider all angles. And eventually, we arrive at a, uh, uh, we arrive at a decision. And so, so it is never easy. Uh, the, the, the idea, it's, it's always great to say that we have got unanimity. Um, but we do not always strive for unanimity. We actually sometimes take pride that we come to you and says that there were different views in the committee because it shows you that there isn't groupthink in the committee, that there are different views and there is a contestation of ideas. And that is very important for the arrival of an appropriate policy uh, policy stance. Dalu, the 
El Nino weather conditions, we have highlighted this um, throughout uh, last year. And uh, it is becoming a trickier day, is, but now looks like the risk of a, to the crops uh, could materialize uh, more than what we thought of uh, last year, as we pointed out that there are uh, dry and hot weather conditions that might be putting a, uh, a, a threat to um, uh, the field crops. Um, they might end up being less than what was expected. As a matter of fact, the national crop uh, estimates had already come up and revised their um, output for uh, uh, crop estimates this year lower. And, and as we, we would have seen in the past, that poses a risk to uh, food inflation, and that complicates the disinflation process uh, that uh, we, had actually, uh, we had actually seen. GFACRA, um, GFACRA there, are, there, 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 there is a piece of legislation that must be passed, uh, which is called the Appropriations uh, Act. A bill at the moment, until such is passed, there will be no transfer that will take place from uh, GFECRA to the Treasury. Hillary. Um, Hillary Joffe from Business Day. Um, a follow-up question on the GFECRA. Um, how does that, does that make your implementation of monetary policy more complicated? And at least in simple terms, can you run us through how that affects the day-to-day -day of monetary policy and whether it has any influence on monetary policy decisions, because you're pumping a lot of money into the market? And second, unrelated question, um, there are five of you on the committee this time. We are Looking forward to six of you next time with uh, Mampo Modise joining you. You'll then have an even number again and a casting vote for you, Governor, which I know is not the ideal. Will you then be looking for a seventh member of the committee? Um, thank you. Um, you know, uh, I have said so much about Jifekra. And when I am tired of saying it, I ask DG Kasim to say it. Uh, maybe now that we have got a new kid on the block, uh, who is in his second MPC, I give this question to him. Go for it, then. Okay. Uh, thanks, Hillary, for the very easy question. Uh, as you know, it's an extremely complicated subject and very hard to explain clearly. Uh, so we expect to expand the liquidity surplus. We operate a surplus system for monetary policy implementation since mid-2022. The idea here is that we pay interest on excess reserves, like a lot of other big central banks. We pay that interest at the policy rate. If banks have got a better idea for what to do with the money, then they can go and do it. But depositing money at the central bank means it's very safe and it's very liquid because it's cash. It's in your current account, literally. So that doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a bank to go and buy some other asset that pays less than the policy rate if they can just get the policy rate with us. Uh, so the expectation is there's more money in the system, but it all comes back to us at the end of the day, and it doesn't change in a very large way financial conditions. The banks just have a bit more liquidity. When we built out the surplus system, we think that got rid of some distortions. We saw some movements in near-term rates, JIBAR, the FX implied. They compressed towards the policy rate, probably a good thing. In 2023, when we expanded liquidity from about 45 billion to about 80 billion with the drawdown of the, steril uh, the sterilization deposit account, which is Treasury's money, uh, we saw very small impacts on market rates. And our understanding of that is that once the market had more cash than it needed, putting more cash into it really didn't change a lot. Uh, this is a larger amount of money that we'll phase in. We plan to do it quite slowly. We plan to tell people in advance how the liquidity position is going to evolve. We want to have a smooth transition like we achieved with the last two uh, surplus changes. Uh, we don't want to surprise anybody. We don't want to have a material change in financial conditions. Uh, and so the policy stance should continue to be captured by the repo rate, which is set by the MPC, and not by another variable, which is the amount of liquidity. So it's still, you want to know what the policy stance is, it's the policy rate. Thanks. Zianda. Thank you, Governor. 
The next question is from Eldrin Simpia at SAFM. He's asking, uh, Governor, at the FSCA industry conference, you said um, you were confident that we will exit grey listing by 2025. What informs this confidence, as some analysts say it could be 2026, also considering the lull that normally comes with the general election season? Is that it from online? We've got an, three more questions, Governor, from the same person. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay. Go on, Eldrian. <laughs> it's Atol Jamini from Alliance News, Governor. The MPC statement says major global central banks are expected to cut rates at a slower pace and to start cutting at a later stage. Is this the scenario that is likely to play out in South Africa? CPI has risen from for the second for the CPI has risen for the first two months of 2024. What do you read into this increase? The third and last question, Governor, is inflation expectations suggest that CPI is unlikely to return to 4.5 midpoint. To what degree does, does this worry the MPC? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, I got David to deal with uh, uh, Jifekra there. Uh, uh, Hillary, I've not forgotten your MPC question. I'll come back to it. Uh, DG Fundi, uh, you are more optimistic than I am on the grey listing uh, being removed in 2025, so I will ask you to deal with that question. Um, thank you. So the grey listing is more like a, a relay race. So there are a number of government departments that are involved. Um, some of the requirements relate to supervision and regulation. And that's the area in which we, the South African Reserve Bank, have got responsibility. Some measures relate to financing of terrorism, and that requires uh, law enforcement and intelligence agency involvement. And there are some that involve departments like, uh, or the areas like the master's office, or the companies and intellectual uh, properties uh, area which are responsible for the registration of companies and trusts. And then there is general requirements around law enforcement and prosecution. So the reason why we are optimistic on one part is that in terms of the technical requirements from FATF, meaning, or from the Financial Action Task Force, do we have the laws that allow us to tackle money laundering and financing of terrorism? Uh, we have passed a big chunk of that requirement. Where we are now is the work where they test our effectiveness. Are we implementing our own laws and our own rules, and can we do that consistently? Uh, and these are areas that we are working on. So, Eldred, I would say that departments are working steadfastly on this, and the bulk of the work is done by technocrats and not by our political principles. We do have the necessary support at that level that has come through from cabinet. Uh, but in terms of your concern that there will be a lull after the elections, the bulk of us that are getting this work done under the leadership of the Treasury are our technical people. There are areas of vulnerability that we are aware of. Uh, and, and some of those relate to how steep some of our penalties, financial penalties that we give on institutions are. There are some capacity challenges in law enforcement and some on the prosecution side, but we are working in partnership with the private sector. We are required to see how we can enhance the capacity. But we are all steadfastly working to achieve our 2025 deadline. Thanks, Fundi. Um, Rashad and Chris, um, one of you must deal with the pace of the major central banks and how it impacts on our pace, and the other one of you must deal with the, uh, the rise in CPI early this year and um, the impact of expectations and whether we are confident that we could bring this thing down to 4.5%. Choose my scatter. Uh, okay, let me take the, the CPI one and leave uh, the, the difficult one to Chris. Uh, 